Okay, uh, Father's Day, all the dads, happy Father's Day. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Mother's Day every day. Father's Day only comes once a year. So we should really enjoy this day. We should. Like, just, just bask in it. Sit back, go home, do nothing. Put your feet up on the couch the other day, because you can't do it the other days. And take the remote in your hand because usually somebody else has it. And, and just, um, just bask in your fatherliness this whole afternoon. And, uh, and we're going to bless you later on with, a, I think, the best Father's Day gift ever, in my opinion. Like... You'll see why, but I really think so. For me, it's the best Father's Day gift ever. Um, but preparing for Father's Day um, and thinking about Father's Day and thinking about fathers and thinking about what's going on in the world and thinking about fathers and thinking about fathers and the purposes of fathers and, and why we celebrate this day and thinking about dads and what dads are supposed to, to do and who dads are supposed to be. And what I see going on in the world, and then thinking about Father's Day again, and thinking about dads again, and thinking about men, and thinking about, about um, fathers. I did a lot of thinking about Father's Day this week. Lots. Like, well, for the last two weeks, been thinking about it a lot. Because um, I honestly believe we, we live, and we are living currently uh, in a day where uh, people and men and society, where, where we have surrendered meaning for convenience, right? It's something, something that is meaningful. We'd rather just want to do something that is easy, something that doesn't take or cause any problems for anybody around us. We, we, like meaning has kind of lost, lost its value in society today. Uh, people have also surrendered purpose for existence. <laughs> I, I know uh, you would know people like this also. How are you doing? Yeah, you know what? I don't know why I'm here but at least I'm still breathing, right? I, I don't know what my purpose is. I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. I'm not content. Hey, but at least I'm still alive. Doesn't that sound like a great life? <laughs> right? It just sounds so amazing. And I, I know for dads, they, they, there's many dads that go through this. Uh, ladies, you might not know this, or kids, you might not know this. When, when dads hit their, say, 50s, because <laughs> I'm almost there, but 45, 50, and you start evaluating your life, and you think, you know, I had all these dreams and all these plans of where I want to be, and right now I'm just working, and, and it feels purposeless, but hey, at least I'm still here. I can still spend time with my kids. Uh, there are so many of your fathers and your husbands that have this feeling inside of them that you don't even realize this is how they feel. And I think, unfortunately, I really believe, unfortunately, the, this dilemma, the greatest place where we see it today, and you might not realize this because culture and society and media won't tell you this, the greatest place where I see this compromising purpose for existence is in men. In dads, fathers, they're surrendering purpose for existence, and, and this has caused problems. Problems, I tell you. Lots of problems. The struggle of manhood today in this world has caused chaos in every area of our lives. And you might not uh, draw the line, make the connection yet, but I'm telling you, it is causing chaos in society and in culture. And here's the thing, why? It's because there's a refusal or a failure. A failure of males 
All you dads, welcome to Father's Day service. Um, there's a failure on, on our side. Men, to become the men that God has called us and purposed us to be. Ezekiel 22. Man, such a great scripture. Verse 30, it says, God says, <laughs> and listen to this. I tried to find a man to stand in the gap so I would not have to curse the land, but I could find none. It's not because there were no males. There were plenty of males around. Now, if you are in doubt, if you are a male or a female, whatever tools you were born with, determines what you are, male or female. It's simple. And, uh, and uh, so, so when God created Adam, uh, you know, I'm, I'll go into this next week. I'm going to, because the, the Bible clearly tells us the difference between the two. There's a clear indication what's the difference between the two. So there were plenty of males Throughout the world. There's plenty of males currently right now, but there are not a lot of kingdom men. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1 says, They looked for a man. <laughs> now, you can't put this more direct than this. They looked for a man among all the males, and they couldn't find one. Hey, <laughs> how's that for, for just a reality check? They looked for a man among all the males. They couldn't find one. Which means it's possible to be a male and not be a man. The way God defines it. Genesis chapter 18. Wow. If you want to go, go, go read uh, like a, for me it's like a reflection chapter of where we are right now. Genesis chapter 18, it says, um, in it, what we are seeing is we are looking at a culture in chaos. This culture in Genesis chapter 18, complete chaos. It's in decline, it's going down, and it's getting ready to be judged. It, it doesn't know it, but God's looking at the society, and he's saying judgment's going to fall in the society. Uh, the society, uh, you, you will recognize it when I give you the names. The names are um, Sodom and Gomorrah. God's looking at that society and he's going, that society is going to be judged. And here's the key thing. All of the problems in Sodom and Gomorrah were caused by men. Due to men. Here's, here's a list of what they were. They were rapists. Then it talks about they were living in, in a context of social injustice. They were oppressing the poor. <laughs> Anybody who does not think like them, speaks like them, accepts everything that they accept were judged. It says that they were, there was a problem of homosexuality. Bible speaks on it. There was a problem of violence, social oppression, and all of this, we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God's view regarding right and wrong has not changed. And this morning, I, I, in our prayer time before the, before the service, I, this is what we stand on as a, as a church. I stand on the word as my truth and my guide. That's, that's our guideline. Um, and, but I do want to, I want to make this very clear. My, I do not judge people for their decisions. People have the right to choose whatever lifestyle they want. My desire for every person is that they can be everything that God has called them to be. That they can live a life of abundance. That is my desire. Where the word speaks out, that is what I stand on. You do not have to be in agreement, and we can be friends, and you are welcome here, even keeping your opinion, and I can have mine. It doesn't mean if you're on a different opinion, you can't be here. Please be here. This is where God's Spirit moves and works. So, so he's saying these were the things that were happening in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Bible says it. It's not me. So God looked down, and he saw the evil, and he saw the decline of culture, and he was, 
preparing to judge it. And that's what the Bible says. I want to make this very clear. I stand on what the Bible says. So Abraham, listen to this. It says, Abraham was in the vicinity of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was in the, in the vicinity of a decaying culture. As you and I are in a vicinity of a decaying culture today. For all the same reasons. And maybe a few more. <laughs> and God gives him three things. And we're going to look at those three things today. To inspire and encourage the men. If you haven't felt inspired and encouraged yet, you will be by the end. Just stay with me. Okay. Genesis 18 verse 19. It says, I have chosen him. Now, now listen to those words. He said, I have chosen him, Abraham. I've chosen him in the midst of this decay. I've chosen a man in the midst of all the stuff that's happening in this culture. In the, in the midst of everything that's happening, I've chosen a man in the midst of this culture. And then he says, I have found a man. I have selected him. And I've chosen him for a purpose. I have found a man. Now, how do we know that, that God chose him for a purpose? Because it says in verse 17, he says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? In other words, listen, I've got something that I'm up to. There's something that I want to accomplish. And, and this plan that I have, am I going to hide it from Abraham? No, because I found a man who I'm going to work through. And, and this is a big point in the message. God needs a man in agreement with his plans. To accomplish his purposes, he needs a man that will stand in agreement with what he wants to achieve and accomplish in this culture and in this society. He can't do it the way he plans to do it if men are not on board. And the first thing every male needs to understand is that you have a divinely orchestrated reason for your manhood. There is a reason why you are a man. There is a purpose for you as a man. And when a man accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, his personal Savior, men, when you accept him, you are drafted into the purposes of God the moment you accept him immediately. Now I am drafted into God's purposes for this world and for my life. There is meaning for me right now. There might have been before, but I have a purpose right now. And we have to discover that. Because unfortunately, many men, some of them go to church. Some of them have never been to church, might be a Christian when they were young. But many men don't care to know the purpose that God has for them. And that is a tragedy. And therefore they live lives uh, distracted in their purpose by culture. Culture is, is steering us in wrong directions for what we are here to do and what we are supposed to do. We are distracted because you're living in the presence of a culture in trouble. In the presence of your own desires and your own designs and your own plans. We're living in the midst of that. And many men, most men, we are distracted by all the chaos that's going on around us. And many men are being shamed when they take a stand in one area or arena or speak out based on who God is in them. That they become quiet and reluctant to say, I am a son and a child of God. And I have a divine purpose. And this is where we're living right now. And then what happens is because we don't chase the purpose of God for our lives, we have a delinquent purpose. And we will become distracted from God's purposes. See, the reason, and if you get anything from today, just get this. The reason that Adam knew what he was supposed to do in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam, he said to him, listen, this is what you're supposed to do. Adam, 
He said, Adam, man, man, I want you to guard, and I want you to keep the garden, and I want you to work in it. That's purpose. That's what I want you to do. Like how many men here would go, man, man, if God would speak to me and tell me this is what I want you to do, would be, oh, that would be so clear. How many would you would do it? Like some of you, right? That's great. Okay, so that, that's great. So some of you would go, yes, if God told me this is what I'm supposed to do, then I'll do it. Okay, uh, he, here's the key. Before Adam rebelled against God, it says... Adam gulakt. Everybody say gulak and then wipe the guy in front of you's back. <laughs> say gulak, 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 gulak. Good. Some, some Hebrew. Gulak. Say it again. You know, it's like you're cleaning your throat. <laughs> you got it? Yeah. So, so the word he uses here is an amazing word. It means to walk hand in hand with a loved one as if you are strolling in the cool of the day. The reason Adam knew his purpose before he rebelled was because he walked with God. It is impossible, fathers, men, fathers to be, men to be, to know your purpose. It's impossible to know it if you don't walk with God. You have to, and not just visit Him on Sundays. You have to walk with him every single day. Every single day. Throughout your day, throughout your conversations, throughout your business meetings, where you have to make decisions in those moments. The first place you go is, Father God, oh, lead me in this decision. Lead my tongue. Lead my emotions. Steer my thoughts. In the cool of the day, throughout the whole day, you walk with him. Every decision you're making, when you're in the gym, God, I'm running right now, but is there somebody here that you want me to influence? God, I'm at Starbucks. Is there somebody here that you want me to speak to? Is there some? It's that that every moment. It's in that that you discover God's purposes for you. He says, "I've got some stuff," and he speaks about Abraham here, and he's saying, "I'm not going to hide it because Abraham, you are a man. Because you walk with me." I will reveal purpose to you. So the first thing, that a real man, what I call a kingdom man, has to understand is is that you have to walk with God to discover your purpose. That's the first thing. The second thing, that a real man, that I call a kingdom man, has to understand is you have a divine design for God's glory And for the expansion of his kingdom. And the expansion of his kingdom includes all the other stuff in your life that you are going for. There is a divine purpose for your existence. God says, every man here, if you've accepted Christ, God says the following to you. I have chosen you. You have a purpose. Proverbs 20 verse 5 says the following. In the heart of every man is a purpose. But the man must draw it out. In you, in seed form, is purpose. But you have the obligation to draw that purpose out. You must be able to communicate to people when they ask you, what is your purpose? You must be able to communicate to them, this is my purpose. Uh, When I was in Minnesota this week with Andrew, we watched that movie, um, Anger Management, of Adam Sandler and Jack Nicholson. Nicholson, Nicholson, Nicholson. Um, I'm getting confused with the golfer. Um, and, And what this movie is about, it's so funny. It's about this guy that has this anger inside of him that that. It's, he starts off really nice, really nice, really nice, and then suddenly he just explodes. And the first time you see it is when he's in this meeting where they sit around in the, in the group and they say, hi, my name is, and then you kind of say, and then Jack Nicholson, um, a buddy, asks um, Adam Sandler's, uh, Sandler, Sandler, Adam Sandals, um, and he, 
ja ihm. He straight talked to him and he said to him, listen, tell me, tell me who you are. And he goes, well, my name is Dave. And he said, no, 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 no. That's, that's your name. Tell me who you are. He says, well, you know, I work in this industry. And I say, no, 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 that's what you do. Tell me. And every time he says, no, 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 Adam, you can see like he's getting more and more angry. And, and it gets to the point of he doesn't know who he is. And the same way, I want to say to, to the men in this place, there is a purpose that God has for you. And if I have to ask, go through this room and ask every man in this place, tell me your purpose. No, 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 that's, that's what you do. Tell me your purpose. No, that's how you feel. Tell me your purpose. I think there are so many men here that don't know their purpose. And it comes with walking with God. I'm going to reveal some of the purposes that God has for us this morning. But there are far too many men who are living without divine purpose. It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how far down the road you are. Most men can talk about their career. And they can talk about their business goals. And they can talk about their finances. But when you ask them what's God's purpose for you, they get quiet. Because they don't spend the time with God to discover it. If you are a man here, you've been selected. You've been called. You've been drafted by God for His kingdom purposes. Now, you don't want to live your life like that. None of us want to look back at our lives and never know what I lived for. But the choice to, to become a kingdom man it, it involves our participation. It, it's, you, you're going to have to do something about it. It's not a passive choice where you sit down in your couch this afternoon and go, okay, God, I've decided I'm going to be a kingdom man. That's a great place to start. But being a kingdom man involves participation. You're going to have to participate. You have to participate. So how then? If, if I know some of the guys are going, okay, so how? Like Andreas, uh, like I'm like most of you. Give it to me simple. Um, not because you guys are, are simple. Um, but, but I just like, that. just give it to me straight. Like how do I do this? How do I become a kingdom man? Like what should I do? I'm so glad you asked. This is how. It's very simple. Start by doing things God's way. It's really that simple. It's, it's seriously, this is not complicated. This is not complicated. You want to be the man like God said, yeah, I, I have found me a man that qualifies for me to reveal my purposes to him. You want to be that man that qualifies for God to reveal his purpose for your life. You want to be that guy. I want to be that guy. It starts by following his principles and his instructions. Not your opinion. I, I, seriously, I, um, I, I know for many of us, we have this thing about thinking but that your opinion matters. It really does not. It really does not. God's word is our truth. If you want to discover God's purposes for you as a man, do things His way. That's how simple it is. Sitting on the couch is a great, it's great. Saying, God, I want to do things your way. God, I want your purposes. Reveal it to me. It's going to take your actions. And I want to say this again. The purposes are already inside of you in seed form. It's in there. It's in you. Every single one of us. God's purpose is already inside of us. It says in Proverbs, I'm going to read it again. In the heart of every man is a purpose. The wise man brings it out. So it's already there. God's purpose is already there. For you to activate the seed, like to shine the sun on it, I have to walk in the sun. 
Darkness does not bring seed to life. I have to walk in it. He says, I'm not going to hide anything from Abraham. What am I about to do? Because this man is operating according to my authority in relationship with me. I'm going to reveal it to him. The second thing, that's the second thing. The third thing he says in verse 19. First thing is walk with God. Second thing is start doing things his way. Walk with God, be in relationship with him. That's where it starts. Start doing things every area of, li- of your life, and you cannot exclude areas. Man, listen, I'm going to be, st- like, I haven't been really straight yet this morning. <laughs> But allow me to be very straight with you this morning. Tithing is a biblical principle. I really do not care how you feel about it. It's biblical. We live it out in our lives. We've seen God, and and I'm not telling you to tithe because the church needs your money. We do not. I've seen numerous times where, where, where people have left a church and we go, oh, you know, so, so, so that means moment people leave, you know, financially, how's the church going to, and then suddenly God brings in abundance to us, more than what we can imagine or hope for. It's not about your dollars. Hear me. It's got nothing to do with your dollars. It's got to do with you walking In God's instruction. And don't tell me nonsense like I give to that ministry there and I give to that ministry there. That is not biblical. The Bible says you bring your tithe to the storehouse. What is your storehouse? Where are you being fed? If you're not being fed yet, by all means, I apologize. The hope is to feed you. (laughs) That is the hope. But, but, But listen, this is not for me. This is for you. You want God's purposes for your life. And for most men, this is the hardest one. Because it shows who you are submitted to. It's the kindergarten of Christianity. It's level one. Use it, don't use it. So the third thing he says... In verse 19, um, just, I just hope all the dads have, are really <laughs> encouraged this morning. Um, the goal is for us to be. Uh, and I'm going to tell you now why. We're getting to this. This is now the part that is so, fu- this is so foundational for Father's Day. In verse 19, so that he may command, listen to this, he may command his children and his household after him. To keep the way of the Lord and to do righteous and justice. So that he may command his children and his household. What's the first thing? Relationship with God. What's the second thing? I'm going to do things his way. Third thing, so that he may command his household. The misunderstanding is, is that, that woman's, a, a woman's job in the home, the mother's job is to raise the children. Now that may come from culture. It may come from society. But that doesn't come from Scripture. That doesn't come from the Bible. It says, I command Abraham to raise the children, and to teach them righteousness and justice. Abraham, I have found a man. There are many amazing fathers in this room. I have found a man. And my instruction to him is I'm going to give him the purposes and the plans that I have. And the reason I'm going to do that is because he walks with me. He's doing things my way and he is instructing his home. Ephesians 6 verse 4 says, Fathers, raise your children. Train up your children. Fathers, raise your children. In the Bible's time, it was the man's job to raise the children and not the woman. The scripture says that I chose him 
and I want to raise and train him up so that he can raise and train up his children to follow. And the reason why we have chaos today in this world is because daddy can't be found. The fathers have either left physically or emotionally or they have neglected the role that they've been given. And for many of them, they don't, they don't know what their role is. So I totally understand it. And I want to say thank God for all the great men. I can look in this place and I can identify fathers that have gone through hard times that have completely stayed in their roles as fathers. And I'm proud of you guys for doing it. Because we, it's such a responsibility. But also know that, that some fathers, some of you who are here, you've never had a father figure or the right one to show you what it means to walk out God's way of fathering. But he says about Abraham, I've chosen him so that he may command his children after him. So, so he's setting up the pace for the house. He's setting up, he's establishing the structure for the home. Now, Deuteronomy, and, and I want to bring some clarity here. Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, and also 6, 6, and also 6, 9, it says the following. Teach your sons and grandsons. Fathers, teach your sons and grandsons. Teach your sons, teach your sons, teach your sons and grandsons. It's like he keeps going on. Teach your sons and grandsons. Why didn't he say daughters? Teach your daughters and your granddaughters. Why does he say son, 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 sons? Why is it so much in scripture that the sons have to be taught? Now, it's not because the daughters weren't important to teach them. But because the sons were to be prepared to replicate the father in the families that they themselves established. Dads. Your role is to teach your sons to father. So when it's their turn to father, they walk with God, do things his way, and it's transferred to the son again. To any dad out there who has a son that thinks he's going to date my daughters. I want to tell you very clearly, the person I look at is not how beautiful the mom is because that might be like Ermery, like people go, yeah, you, you know, you have to marry Kaylee because, you know, when she's older, she's going to be stunning. Just look at her mom, right? It's different for men. That, yeah, let's just be honest about that one. Like I'm like, Adjo, yeah, who are you dating? Where's the mom? <laughs> nah, that's not going to work. Uh-uh, mm-mm. No, that doesn't age well. Um, again, that's just a bonus. Dads, use it, don't use it. Um, but, but here's the thing. I look at the dad. I look at the dad. Because the son is going to replicate. Now, daughters, please hear me. If you are a father of just daughters, what you should do for them you should be the example of the husband they want to have one day. Because my dad is such an amazing father. I am not going to settle for dirt. I'm not. Now, give me another moment just to explain this before you get a little more offended. Um, there is function... There is function. We have to get this part. Please, um, all the ladies, all the men, please hear me. There is function and purpose in God's kingdom. And we have to understand function and purpose. All things are created with purpose. God, God didn't do something, ah, I'm going to make that. I don't know what it's for, but it's there anyway. Everything God created has function and purpose. Men and women were created with purpose. Equal in value Different in purpose. Say that again. Value for sons and daughters are the same. They are equal in value. And this is where the church, uh, I think the church have messed us up in the past. Because of the sons, 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 sons. There's been a thing where they think men are more of value to the church. They are not. We are equal in value. But we have a different purpose. God did not say sons are more important. 
what he said is, sons, you are going to step into a role, and dads, you have to teach them how to step into that role. The sons are to be taught so that they can fulfill their roles in the future. And this is foundational, and it's biblical. And even if you don't like it, it's still God's plan, and it's still His way. Men in this place, hear my voice. You are to be the teacher in the home of how to follow God. And you are to teach your sons. Some things are structural and some things are foundational. And you can change it or remove it, which we recently learned. In a home, um, we know that there are certain walls that are weight-bearing walls. But there are certain walls that you can remove, separating walls, both very valuable. I believe a weight-bearing wall is just as important as a bathroom separation wall. <laughs> Make sense? Very true. Thank you very much. So, Ernie and I decided recently we're going to renovate our kitchen, so, so we are kind of go get it. So, we decided the night, and the next morning, I decided, okay, we decided, so we just have to do it. So, I started ripping out a wall, took the drywall off, and based on the plans that we have for our property, there are thin black walls on the sketches, and there are thick black walls on our, on our plans. So, I'm thinking, which one do you think is the weight-bearing wall? Yeah, that's what I thought also. So I started taking off drywall, and as I'm taking off the drywall, and I'm busy taking out the door, and I'm looking at the top of the door, and I'm saying, ha, huh, there's a beam. Now I'm about to take, a, I'm about to take down two by four studs. I'm about, I've got the sledgehammer ready. I'm going to start knocking. So, so then I do what, I, I have the little voice of the Holy Spirit inside me that's called Mark Crampett. And... <laughs> And I take a picture of the wall, and I send it to Mark. And I'm like, Mark, do you think this is a weight-bearing wall? And he responds, oh, most definitely. <laughs> weight-bearing wall. So we removed the drywall from it and now because we were very impulsive. Emery told me to do it. Um, <laughs> and removing the drywall. So now we've got everything down. It's just studs and this thing in there. So Mark comes. And <laughs> little did we realize that this is not just a weight-bearing wall. This is the most important weight-bearing wall in the home. If you remove this one, so, so all the joists from both sides of the house connect on this one. Remove this one, and it collapse. Listen, this principle of fathers for the home. This is a weight-bearing wall for the home. Your function, dad, is to keep the house up. And I want to say again, I'm one of those people that I really believe bathroom time is private time. And I feel the value of those bathroom walls are just as valuable as those walls that's bearing the weight. They are different in purpose, but they have the same value. That means it doesn't matter if you are a daughter. You have value, and there's a purpose for you. But dads, this morning we're focusing on you. We have this mindset of, you know, yeah, um, dads, and this, yes, I really want to get this into I hope you hear me. This thing of, of, of where we, we go... Um, you know, uh, the kids, we were out last night, and, uh, you know, he played hockey, or he did this. Oh, he can just sleep in this morning. It's not that important for him to go. Just let him sleep in. But wake up the girls. Mom, you and the girls go, I will stay home with him. It's not that important for him to go to church. But she has to go. Listen, the boys should be here. And dads, it's your role to fulfill that, to make sure that you get them here. Church is not for softies, which many men think. Church is for men. It is. Because it means that you're going to stand in firm foundations where others might disagree. 
But you've got a relationship with God. Real men go to church. Man, that should be a something. Put it on a t-shirt, yeah. And it is the only place, why? It's the only place where you can discover what a real man is. Because when men refuse to do what God wants him to do, it creates havoc in the home and in relationships. God says, I want you to raise up your kids. I want you to set the pace. I want you to establish the framework for the future because the kids represent the future. Our kids are not a lost generation. They are simply a product of a lost generation. But it's not too late to take it back. Dad, you've got an incredible role. You have an incredible role. Doesn't matter where you've been up to now, what are you going to do from here on forward? We need men that can quote Bible as much as you can quote statistics. We need men that can name the, the prophets and the disciples as much as you can name the football team of the New York Giants. We need men that, that are willing not just to talk hockey or sports or, or musical theater uh, for whatever it might be. Whatever the interest is that you are driving. We need men that are willing to stand, drive in the car with your kids and go, you know what, son? I had this, for me, it was a great moment with my son this week. When I said to him, you know, all these things that we are doing, everywhere you are going, those things matter. But there is nothing in this world more important than your relationship with God. There's nothing. And we must reflect that. Dads, we have to be a reflection of the value that we have in our relationship with God. Because our children, they are not daft. They will not be fooled. We can't fix the family if the dads don't stand up. We can't fix the community if the families don't rise up. And the communities, you can't fix the White House or the government. And I know there are all these great causes out there. But man, if your house is not in order, how do you think you're going to make a difference out there? So what do we teach them? What do we teach our children? Two things. You teach them righteousness. Dads, take, them, take note of these two things. What am I supposed to teach my children, my sons, and my daughters, what I'm supposed to teach them, I'm supposed to teach them righteousness, and I'm supposed to teach them justice. Righteousness is what? Righteousness is your vertical standing before God. This is how I'm standing before God in relationship. That's your walk with God. That's your living to please God. Setting a spiritual standard. Dads, you set the spiritual standard in your home that everybody knows about. It's not a secret. You don't have a secret standard. You have a standard in your home that your sons and your daughters and your wife sees and knows about. It's not vague. This is what we do in this house. This is how we live in this house. This is what we value. This is what we honor. This is how we respect God's word as the truth. This is how we live out God's word as the truth. Joshua said the following, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Everybody in our family ought to know we serve God in this house. And here's how we do it. It should be clear. In other words, divine guidelines are established by dad, by the father, if you are the father. You set the righteous standard. This is right. This is wrong. God says so. He told me to teach you based on his word, not my opinion or my experience. We're going to do things God's way. So let's review the rules of the house. Let's review God's instruction. And the rules of the house and God's instruction is not to hold you back. Kids, it's not to spoil your fun. It's not. The same principle that Stacy taught this morning. Why do we give our tithe? So that God can oppose the devourer. 
Why do we live inside of his instruction? Because outside of it, there is one who wants to devour. And then you have to teach them justice. Righteousness is your obedient walk with God. Justice is your unbiased treatment of mankind. Justice is horizontal. This is how we deal with people. I'm, as a dad, listen, as, you, as you're driving, as you get angry, standing in line, whatever it might be that you're going through every day in your life while people are around you, this is how I treat people. This is how kind I am. This is how loving I am. And the first place it starts is, this is how I treat my wife. This is how I treat your mother. How are you doing that? Doesn't matter if she agrees with you, disagrees with you. Doesn't matter if you are divorced or married. Doesn't matter if she's hurt you or not. I am going to treat her with love and respect and honor no matter what happens. This is how I'm going to treat people. You teach them that. And in the house, it's supposed to come from you, dads. I'm skipping some because our time's up and the kids are ready to come and bless the dads. I want you to hear me. The Bible says that God made men stronger. He made us a stronger vessel, the word says. We are a stronger vessel, not because we are more valuable, but because we are supposed to bear more weight. We are supposed to bear weight. See, the nature of a foundation that you have, the weight-bearing walls, it's not about how pretty the wall is. Man, stop looking how pretty you are. Fathers, it's not how pretty you are. I'm saying exercise, please do that. It's good for you. Uh, shower, please. Uh, put clothes on, comb your beard, whatever you need to do. But, but the foundation of a house, it's not supposed to be, it's not about the looks of it. It's about the weight it can bear. Every man has been called by God to biblical manhood, not merely maleness. You can be the one that sets the difference in your home between being a man after God's heart or being a male. And guys, I hope that every single one of you has a desire to be a man. Man, let's be men. Real men cry. we vulnerable. We open up. We show our relationships. We love. We teach our children. We treat people with honor and respect. We talk about our relationship with our Father. We open up our hearts. Train up your kids. Love your wives. Amen? Let's pray. And the kids can come in, Richard. Father God, I want to thank you for every man that this morning wants to answer the call to say, yes, I want to be a kingdom man. And Father, if there's any man here this morning that's saying, I'm going to change my ways and I'm going to do things your way. I, I pray, Father, that this will not simply be a, a sit back in a chair decision, but that this will be something that is real to every single one of them that they make that change in their lives that they need to make so that they can be the fathers that you've called them to be. So, Father, I pray a blessing over every home, over every family in this place. I pray that your love will shower them. And, Father, what I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to hear about the purposes that you've revealed in the men that have said yes. I look forward to seeing that. In Jesus Christ's wonderful name we pray. Amen.